Hello, and thank you for tuning into my talk on hydrodynamics and metacoronal paddling. I'm Arvind Sathanakrishnan. I'm a faculty at Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Oklahoma State University. I'd like to acknowledge my uh, graduate student and co-author on this talk, Mitchell Ford, uh, for all the incredible work he's put in into this study. I'd like to start by showing what metacoronal paddling typically looks like in long tail crustaceans that uh, use this technique for swimming underwater. Uh, the video here shows uh, freely swimming behavior of freshwater shrimp and uh, long tail crustaceans like these species use drag based for paddling propulsion and it involves coordinated rhythmic oscillations of uh, pairs of closely spaced swimming limbs that are attached to the abdomen. Uh, these limbs are also known as player pods the pleopods are themselves oscillated in a sequential manner, starting from the posterior to the anterior. And this generates a tail to head metacronal wave that is in the same direction as the animal. And that is shown in the bottom right image on the uh, right hand side. And the direction of the power stroke is from anterior to posterior and recovery stroke is from posterior to anterior. Uh, one thing to particularly note is that there's a time delay or a phase lag between one pair of pleopods to the next adjacent pair. The direction uh, uh, of, of the recovery stroke moves water in the uh, direction that doesn't help the animal to swim forward as fast as the direction of the power stroke. And so what these uh, animals typically do is they fold their pleopods uh, using hinged articulations in their structure. A surprisingly large number of crustacean species have adapted uh, the use of metacoronal paddling for propulsion. And the size ranges from anywhere from 100 microns, like a uh, copepod shown on the left, and all the way to tens of centimeters, uh, such as lobsters in the farthest right point. This suggests that metacoronal propulsion is a fairly robust locomotion strategy that can function across a range of orders of magnitude of size. Another important point is that this locomotion strategy is also used across broad morphological diversity in body shape and number and structure of pleopods. And if you look at the remipedes in the middle, uh, the nectopods, nectopods, remipedia, what you'll see is that they have a large number of limbs compared to something like a krill or a mantis shrimp uh, shown in the same plot. Um, and the locomotion strategy is also used for a range of behavioral needs. So this can be including hovering, accelerating, escaping, migrating, uh, jet-assisted walking. And it's also used by animals that are vastly different ecologies. Uh, so euphosids, like the, the curl species, they spend most of their lives swimming in the pelagic zone as uh, compared to benthic stomatopods like mantis shrimp that swim far less uh, frequently. Metacronal propulsion is used among a number of ecologically important species. Um, small crustaceans such as copepods uh, serve as the major component of planktonic footwebs. Antarctic krill, uh, see the top left here, uh, serve as a direct link between phytoplankton and larger animals, such as fish and whales. And they're also known to be obligate schooling species. So studies of metacronal swimming can offer insight into structure function relationships, that is inherent to the propulsion system design to understand how it's able to uh, be adapted by so many different species can also be used to examine hypotheses related to schooling, uh, such as drag reduction and potential signaling, hydrodynamic signaling between ind individuals in an aggregate. Finally, there's been a lot of uh, interest in looking at organism induced or biogenic mixing. And uh, there's been a recent study of uh, collective motion of brine shrimp shown on the uh, rightmost uh, figure here that suggests that collective motion of crustaceans can indeed cause vertical mixing. And species such as mycids perform daily vertical migrations. And so there's a possibility for uh, the collective to create more of an impact um, on the mixing as compared to a small individual. In terms of organismal level studies of metacronal swimming, a lot of the uh, attention has been focused on euphosids and copepods because of their ecological importance. I chose some results from a few studies where they've uh, 
looked at fluid dynamics of eupausid swimming. So a lot of the earlier studies used tethered animals, such, such as the one shown in the top left figure. And studies on freely swimming individuals shown in the middle, they showed noticeable differences in both the stroke kinematics and flow fields as compared to the tethered uh, studies. Remarkably, a recent study from Murphy et al. showed uh, using tomographic three-dimensional PIV that Antarctic krill during hovering can generate tip vortices. And these flow structures are typically associated with lift generation. Well, organismal studies are actually very important and valuable because it helps us to understand stroke kinematics, energetics, hydrodynamics, aspects of this locomotion strategy, and all particularly under different behaviors. One of the challenges is that there's a broad diversity of morphologies and behaviors of crustaceans using this strategy. And so it makes it difficult to identify unifying physical design principles underlying metacoronal propulsion systems. Also live animal studies present their own challenges because they are difficult to repeatedly control both in terms of uh, position of the animal orientation and also to elicit the same animal behavioral responses over and over. So alternative approaches such as physical modeling and computational simulations, they can be particularly helpful in exploring the parameter space from a mechanistic perspective. The rest of this talk, I'll show you how we've leveraged robotic models that are informed uh, by live animal studies to study the, the hydrodynamics of metacronal swimming and paddling. For this talk, I'm gonna focus on three different questions. Uh, first thing is generation of vertical momentum or downward momentum. Uh, Non-swimming krill, for example, have been uh, observed to sink by as much as 500 meters in three hours. And this is because they, like many adult crustaceans, are negatively buoyant. So we wanted to understand how oscillations of paddles about a horizontal plane can generate vertical downward momentum, which is needed because they have to support their weight during hovering. Next, we will look at the functional roles of spacing between the limbs of pleopods and how varying stroke kinematics can impact swimming performance. To look at this vertical momentum generation uh, by metachronal paddling, we, we developed a tethered uh, robotic platform that's shown here in these diagrams. We have four flat plate acrylic paddles. They were driven by stepper motors and they were programmed to oscillate with prescribed kinematics. We incorporated mechanical hinges in our paddles and you can kind of see the bent paddle structure because this allows the paddles to unfold in power stroke and fold in a recovery stroke, similar to what is seen in crustacean swimming. The entire system was immersed in an aquarium tank and we used varying mixtures of water glycerin solution to vary the Reynolds number, which captures the effect of inertial to viscous forces. And this kind of allows us to kind of look into how animal size, for example, uh, and or the speed of the animal can affect downward momentum generation. And so the Reynolds number range we varied is 50 to 800. And this is a, similar to the range that would be expected from juvenile to adult stages of development in crustaceans like crayfish and krill. And we held the stroke kinematic vari variables of uh, amplitude, 90 degrees and frequency of one and a half Hertz constant. And we also varied the phase lag between the paddles starting all the way from synchronous 0% to 33%. And non-zero face lags followed the tail to head pattern that's seen in the animals. And we used a laser to visualize the flow field that was seeded with tracer particles and a camera that imaged um, the particle motion at the plane that's shown as a line along the center of the paddle in the right inside picture. The movies here show the uh, process PIV results uh, and what was shown is velocity vector fields the arrows and the colors indicate the vorticity magnitude that is our plane, which serves to tell how much strength of rotation there is in the fluid flow. And so what we see is that in the synchronous paddling case, which is a left-hand side movie, there's co-rotating vortices that are generated at the paddle tips for every half stroke. So power stroke and recovery stroke, there's these co-rotating vortices, meaning they're of the same sign, they're either red or blue. And the tip vortices are shed at the end of a half stroke 
and in power or at the end of recovery. And the sign of these tip vortices flips from positive to negative and vice versa when going from power to recovery stroke, as you can see in synchronous motion. Power stroke pushes the flow towards the tail, which is on the right side of the movie. And recovery stroke uh, has produces some undesirable flow reversal um, because some part of the flow, particularly near the paddle tips, move in the direction towards the head, which is not conducive for useful thrust generation. In contrast, if you look at the right inside movie where we have a 17% face lag and the same Reynolds number of 250, uh, what we see is that there's counter rotating vortices that are created by the phase delayed interaction of pairs of paddles. Essentially, no two pa adjacent paddles are doing the same thing at any time, like synchronous. And so this forces them to geometrically uh, alter their position such that they come together and move apart. And this essentially creates these counter rotating vortex pairs tip vortices, and the interaction of that results in the formation of a large scale angle downward jet. Essentially, you have these very small scale jets that are formed at the tips of the paddles. And when you operate with a non-zero face lag, it allows these small scale jets to coalesce into a larger scaled angled downward jet. So you can see part of the flow sustainably keeps going downward. Uh, and, and also in the horizontal direction towards the tail. So in order to quantify the, uh, the sort of the thrust um, uh, that we would expect if this were to be a swimming model, but it's tethered, we used the PIV data, the velocity field data, numerical data and calculated vertical momentum flux uh, and averaged it over cycle using this integral equation and this serves as a, uh, this is comparable to the force generation. So it's not exactly the force, but it's uh, uh, in a cycle average sense, it, it is uh, proportional to the force generation. And so what we are showing here is the vertical momentum flux in the x-axis as a function of vertical distance. So zero is the body or the flat plate of where the paddles are mounted to and more increasing y means going farther away from the paddles. And so what you see is that the peak where VMF occurs slightly below the tips of the paddles for all Reynolds numbers and face lags, which we show here. Peak flux uh, was lowest for the Reynolds number of 50 in all the face lags going from the left 0% to the right most 33%. And the um, increasing face lag uh, increase the vertical momentum flux below the paddles. You can kind of see the graph kind of expanding as you go from left to right for any Reynolds number uh, in, in sort of the area under the curve basis. And this suggests that the paddling flow becomes more vertical as you increase face lag. And when we look at increasing Reynolds number uh, from 50 to 800 for any particular face lag, you increase the vertical momentum flux. The increased viscosity um, at the lower Reynolds number, uh, we believe dissipates the vortices quickly. And so this prevents downward propagation of the paddling jet. That's as a result of the interaction in time and space. And for supporting weight and maintaining position in the water, larval krill would uh, probably not need to generate as much vertical momentum as adults because of their relative buoyancy difference. So this helps us to kind of tease out how oscillation about a horizontal plane can generate vertical momentum transfer. In order to look at the next two questions that I mentioned before with the interlimb spacing and the stroke kinematics on swimming performance, we upgraded our facility from being tethered to moving. We developed a self-propelling curl pot for this purpose. So there's five electronically driven paddles that are attached to a 3D printed body and they're suspended from an air bearing that's shown in the left uh, image in the top. The model can swim forward along a straight line using this uh, air bearing with minimal friction on the track uh, and using entirely its own self-generated thrust forces. We uh, conducted geometric scaling with published E superba images to extract ratios of geometric dimensions all relative to play apart length L shown here. And we 3D printed a scaled up body that's about 10 times bigger than, than a typical Antarctic curl would be. And we fabricated these idealized trapezoidal paddles with hinges that's shown in the top right. 
under geometric scaling. In order to make the flow generated uh, by the model to be comparable to the Antarctic krill, we immerse the model inside an eight foot long tank that's filled with the water glycerin mixture of higher viscosity than water. So the Reynolds number is matched with that of the crow. To validate our design uh, to recreate kinematics and flows generated by Antarctic krill, we prescribe playpod root angle alpha as indicated in the bottom left image, black and white image um, in time uh, to our idealized paddles. And the prescribed kinematics are the solid lines in the graphs shown in the bottom right. And we looked at two different swimming gates of E superba, fast forward swimming and hovering. And the kinematics we used were published in a study in 2011 by Murphy et al. We tracked the play pod kinematics and overlaid them against the prescribed kinematics. And as you can see, they mirror the prescribed kinematics very closely. Since we wanted to look at swimming performance and underlying fluid dynamics, we wanted to compare the krill bot flow field to that of freely swimming uh, Antarctic krill. And so the videos here show that they're qualitatively in agreement between the left hand side krill bot and the right hand side uh, movie uh, of a freely swimming Antarctic krill individual. And we also see the same sort of uh, qualitative agreement when we're looking at hovering kinematics uh, with a body angle of 20 degrees in uh, comparison with uh, published data on um, Pacific krill. And the last thing we did was we quantified non-dimensional shrewel number, which is commonly used for oscillating flows. And we found that the krill bot shrewel number compared um, to be quite similar to that of the um, Antarctic krill. So now we proceed to looking at the role of the play apart gap um, on swimming performance in the wake characteristics. Uh, in Murphy et al's 2011 paper, the table shown here, um, they characterized the ratio of interplay apart gap or distance to play apart length in a, in a number of metacronal paddling animals. And so what you see is the biological gap to length ratio, G being gap and L being length of the play apart is, is fairly narrow. It goes from 0.2 to 0.7. In order to look at how the varying this gap to length G over L ratio uh, affects uh, swimming and weight characteristics, we developed a simplified flat plate body and attached our um, mechanical paddles to it, flat plate paddles of 76 mm length as shown here. And we varied the gap while holding the L constant to vary G over L from 0.4 to 1.5. We wanted to intentionally look at what happens when we exceed the biological range here. We also varied phase lag from zero to 20% of the cycle. It's a part of these experiments. And the stroke amplitude was also varied from 55 to 75 degrees. Um, and we increased the stroke amplitude even further beyond 75 degrees, as you can see in the table for a uh, gap to length of one and 1.5 because collision was not a problem because there was larger gaps between the paddles and this permitted larger stroke amplitude. The stroke frequency is maintained constant at two and a half hertz. And the entire the, the range of variation of Reynolds number is in the order of magnitude of uh, freely swimming uh, krill and Antarctic krill. And the variation in Reynolds number is purely because we're varying stroke amplitude. Viscosity was not changed in the study, it was kept constant. What we're showing here is steady state swimming speed of the robot that was measured from tracking. Uh, displacement from high-speed videos. And each plot, the variation shown is face lag uh, with different stroke amplitudes in, within each plot. And uh, phi is face lag here. And so what we see is that across the board, increasing stroke amplitude increases speed irrespective of um, the phi face lag in G over L. And for synchronous paddling, so the top left graph, phi equals zero, percent, we noticed that uh, changing G over L has fairly minimal impact on the speed. However, in contrast, if you look at a non-zero phase lag cases, the other three graphs shown here, changing phase lag, um, uh, generally what we see is that um, for non-zero phase lag conditions, uh, the 
speed decreases with increasing G over L at a given stroke amplitude. So any color, particular color bar, if you compare across the port, you'll see that um, increasing G over L decreases the speed. At larger G over L, like greater than or equal to 1.0, which is not biological range, we notice that changing phase lag phi for a fixed stroke amplitude does not really change the swimming speed. So if you look at the dashed lines that are indicated here, uh, you notice that they end up being the same speed nearly for a given stroke amplitude, despite changing the phase lag phi between the plots themselves. As phase lag promotes hydrodynamic interactions, the lack of this phase lag dependency on speed at larger gap to length, we believe it suggests that hydrodynamic interactions between the paddles are weakened. And um, one can basically increase the speed by increasing stroke amplitude. Phase lag is a little bit more complicated. It depends on the stroke amplitude. Stroke amplitude really does um, affect the swimming performance the most for the constant stroke frequency condition here. If you look at the flow generated uh, under the different gap to lens uh, ratio shown here, so I'm gonna play the first movie, which is gap to length of 0.5. Um, you see that the interaction of the counter rotating tip vortices leads to merging and generation of a fairly strong thrust generating jet. However, with increasing gap to length to one and 1.5, you'll notice a remarkable difference in that vortices do not interact as much due to larger gaps. As a result, the flow tends to be less coherent in a downward angled manner as G over L 0.5 for the higher gap to lens, but it's rather more vertical. Uh, the vortices are stronger as shown by the intense coloring in the 1.5 gap to length ratio, suggesting that the lack of interaction of the vortices reduces the viscous dissipation, which again makes sense However, it doesn't help to increase swimming speed because you're pushing a lot of the flow down. We looked at momentum fluxes, both in the vertical and the horizontal directions as surrogate of forces at different positions um, as indicated one to five um, in the HMF horizontal momentum flux and one zero to four in the vertical momentum flux. And what we see is that decreasing G over L ratio increases the HMF the horizontal flux but also decreases vertical momentum flux. And so if you look at the angle of the net wake momentum vector, we see that larger G over L promotes formation of a more vertically oriented jet. So if you, as you proceed to minus pi over two, that limit is purely vertical. And so the one and a half ratio is, is really more vertical compared to the 0.5. And so this effectively reduces thrust in the larger gap to length ratios and this is an agreement of the swimming speed graphs. So the last part, I'm gonna quickly go over uh, the importance of stroke kinematics. So there's a lot of diversity in stroking patterns within crustacean species. The top left shows pleopod angle variation in a tethered copepod and positive slope here indicates power stroke, negative indicates recovery stroke. Uh, while there's a phase lag in power stroke, the pleopods execute a synchronous recovery stroke here. This is, this hybrid stroking pattern is also seen in other species, in isopods, for example, in the middle top uh, graph there, where the angle definition is flipped. So positive slope corresponds to recovery stroke, which is synchronous in here between the three pleopods. Whereas the power stroke, which is the negative slope, shows a metachronal um, phase lag. And in addition, stroke amplitudes also vary in the isopods and power stroke. And there's a pause before the start of the next recovery stroke. And if you look in comparison of these with these with the uh, euphacids like Antarctic Corral shown on the bottom from our feet all, both the power stroke and recovery stroke are generally metachronal. They're not um, as synchronous as the other two species above. However, phase lag varies depending on the swimming behavior at the cape. Um, as shown in the hovering and fast forward swimming looking different. We've been working with uh, Sheila Patrick's lab at Duke to look at stroke kinematics and swimming performance of uh, a particular species of mantis shrimp. And in these species, the pleopods, as you shown here, have a phase lag in power stroke, which is by the way, the positive slope here, but the recovery stroke is nearly synchronous in the negative slope. 
So we analyze stroke kinematics in terms of the stroke amplitude and overall phase slack, P, P5 to P1 between the player parts separately in power stroke and recovery stroke. And what we find is the normalized swimming speed increases with increasing stroke amplitude in general. And there's a lot of scatter in the power, power stroke phase lag with respect to swimming speed uh, in, the, in the bottom rightmost graph. However, the recovery stroke phase lag, the hollow markers, they showed that the values are a lot smaller in general uh, as compared to the power stroke. So to understand what the geometric consequences are of hybrid stroking, we first mathematically computed distance D here between two paddles that are separated by capital length of 0.5, which is, uh, resembles the species of mantis shrimp we are looking at. And we prescribed them to stroke metachronally with harmonic motion profiles. We varied the stroke amplitude and phase lag in these tests. So when D is greater than zero, as shown in the cartoon, paddles don't collide the two paddles but the paddles collide when D is equal to zero. And so if we overlay this line of collision D equals zero on the previous slides graph, where we were trying to show unachievable and achieve, or not the previous slide, this is a new graph. But if we uh, look at the mantis shrimp animal data and we overlay the D equals zero line on there, which is the border between the dark and the light gray regions, what we find is that the, um, most of the individuals stroke with power stroke, stroke amplitudes that are in the unachievable range based on pure metachrony. So this suggests that this hybrid stroking allows for much larger stroke amplitudes without collisional interference. And this can be really useful for animals that have small interplayer pod spacing. So we hypothesize that the large stroke amplitudes enabled by hybrid stroking will augment swimming speeds and displacement per stroke. And we tested the hypothesis in our self-propelling robot we prescribed harmonic profiles for play pod motion. The plots show test conditions that include synchronous stroking, meta meta, uh, purely metachronal MM uh, with face lags from 10 to 20% and meta synchronous MS face lags again 10 to 20% with filled markers, meta meta is hollow markers. Uh, we tested higher stroke amplitudes specifically in the meta sync stroke pattern because it was feasible to do so without collision. So similar to the animal data, speed increases with stroke amplitude. Displacement per stroke also increases stroke amplitude. There are some phase lags where meta meta in, uh, MM pattern exceeds the speed of MS for the same stroke amplitude. We calculated advance ratio by dividing swimming speed by paddle tip speed uh, and the equation shown on the right. We find that the plot shown in the rightmost plot here uh, as stroke amplitude increases, advance ratio starts to drop eventually. So this suggests that limbs will have to accelerate a lot faster at higher stroke amplitudes to achieve speeds that are closer to, to speeds achieved with lower stroke amplitudes. And if you look at the flow characteristics, there's a more dispersed wake that is seen with hybrid stroking shown on the right, as compared to the metachronal pattern that we've seen before, where there's a more coherent wake. And so the hybrid stroking doesn't necessarily lend itself to a more coherent jet. And so this more dispersed wake can not be, may, may not be as helpful for forward thrust generation. However, you can compensate for that by using large stroke amplitudes. To conclude, I'm gonna put the slides here, uh, but basically we've shown that vertical momentum generation uh, is possible with stroking paddles about a horizontal plane, and it can be affected by Reynolds number and phase lag. Synergistic interactions in terms of the hydrodynamics at smaller gaps between the player pods can augment swimming performance, and hybrid stroking uh, can offer uh, high operation at higher stroke amplitudes without collision, but at the expense of lower advance ratios. I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators at Georgia Tech and Duke University and the wonderful students listed at my lab at Oklahoma State. Thank you for listening to the talk.